y'all here this morning because uh, I think this message holds something for everyone in here today. Um, I tell this message, words have meaning. Words have meaning. Okay. And I know, like, to the confirmation of, like, I know uh, Brother Tootie's got the short end of the stick where he's bringing it every week. Uh, I fortunately have some t more time to prepare for it. So, like, in the time that I'm preparing for it, like, I get great confirmation just through the things that y'all say, the things that are going on. On You know, Lord tells me, like, I'm on the right path. Like, I'm bringing the word that y'all need to hear. And so, uh, so I think this is the message that y'all, that the Lord wants y'all to hear today. And so, um, anyway, well, let's, let's get started and hear it then, right? <laughs> so, uh, amen. All flesh is like grass and of its glory, like the flower of grass, the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of God lives and abides forever. So let's open up the word that lives and abides ever uh, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Gospel of Matthew. And we'll be reading verses 36 and 37. And uh, does anyone need a Bible? Good. If you don't have one, we have some in the back. Take one with you. You know, like God. God provides his grace freely to us, and we just want to reflect that so in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you find your way over there, if you would stand for the reading of the word, if you're able to, to show respect for the word. And I'll be reading out of New American Standard, so if your translation reads a little differently, I think maybe on the screen. So anyway, so in Jesus' name. Okay, and this is Jesus speaking. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. If you bow your head, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for meeting us here today and allowing us to come in your presence, Lord. Give us spiritual ears to hear and spiritual eyes that would be open to see what you'd have us to know today, Lord. Father, you said in your word that it would never return void. So I pray for enlightenment this morning for all who are here. And Father, if there be someone here today that doesn't truly know you, I pray that the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf will be open. That you would speak to them today. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Man, as I was going over these verses, um, I was thinking two things, okay? First of all, that scripture should be very terrifying because of the fact that no matter where you stand, it should check you, you know? And then, uh, but even more so with these two obscure verses that are so powerful and yet at the same time, so easy to gloss over. And and secondly, no one can dodge the statement made by, made by the Lord Jesus. Like no one escapes it. For all we have to do is open up our mouths and the words that come out will let everyone know where we stand and what's in our heart. For example, have y'all ever said something or busted something out or even me, maybe even muttered something under your breath just a little too loud and then thought, I hope no one heard that. I have. I mean, uh, and once the words were unleashed, you probably thought to yourself, like, I wish I never said that, right? But not only that, how about in your everyday speech after having a conversation with someone and you come away from there and the evil one is playing, you said, well, that was stupid. Like, why did I even say that? I mean, can anyone identify with that? Like, man, that's me all the time. But let's face it, words have meaning, 
Okay. And words have power. So let's look at the context to what led up to where Jesus made that statement that we read. And so in verse 22 of the same chapter, y'all can light that up. Okay. Chapter 12, uh, we see that a man was brought to Jesus that was demon possessed and he was blind and dumb. Well, Jesus healed him. And it next says that the multitudes were amazed. But the Pharisees weren't. I mean, Jesus just did a miracle. And to them, it's like, so what? You know, it reminds me of when Moses is standing there before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh demanded, show me a miracle. And Moses and Aaron threw down the staff and it became a serpent. And the sorcerers and magicians are like saying like, so what? We can do that. And they copy it and say, there, that was nothing. And then Aaron's staff, staff swallows up all the others. Well, man, if I was there, I would probably bust out a duty and say, dude, that did it for me. Like, I want that God. But if the Pharisees were there, they would have said, ah, he did it by the power of the, of the demon. Words. Let's see. Because even the multitudes were saying, this man can't be the son of David, can he? I mean, they're getting it, but the Pharisees aren't. They're saying he has a demon. And a parallel passage in Mark sounds even worse because it's the scribes are saying he is possessed by Beelzebub and he casts out the demons by the ruler of demons, Satan himself. So now Jesus is being accused by the scribes and Pharisees that the method by which they, he healed this man was the work of the devil. And Jesus goes on to say in Mark 3, 28, truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. This sin is an eternal sin and what's called the unpardonable sin. And the unpardonable sin is this. It's a sin of unbelief and denying the work of the Holy Spirit. And what is the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, for one thing, the scriptures are the work of the Holy Spirit because they are written through the agency of his ministry as he moved among men to put into writing what God would have us to know. So therefore, rejecting the gospel, the very word that can save them, and for us, and us for that matter, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. For if you reject the gospel, there is no other means of salvation. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts you of the need to repent and believe the gospel. I'll give you an example. I mean, there's many, but like you'll hear someone say, well, man wrote the Bible. They just denied the words that were provided by God to save their very souls by saying that the scriptures are made up by men just to get them to believe in it. I mean, we've all heard that. Now, that's a work of, a de of the devil. And it's the unpardonable sin and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Jesus is doing. So Jesus replies to them in verse 25, if you want to look there. And it's not just their words, because it starts out saying, and knowing their thoughts, he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste. And any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Verse 26. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by who do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be your judges. Their sons were the prophets or the sons of Abraham. Theirs was a true work of God. Verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, 
then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 29, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And who does not gather with me scatters. And so now here's the reason that Jesus stated what he said in his context. Verse 31. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men. But blasphemy against the spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever shall speak a word against the son of man shall be forgiven him but whoever shall speak against the holy spirit it shall not be forgiven him in this age or in the age to come the age to come is judgment and then eternity and so now pay attention to this verse because i don't want to lose you okay jesus says either make the tree good and it's fruit good and, and it's fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for if the tree is known by its fruit. Did y'all get that? It's because it says make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. So did y'all just see what Jesus just did here? In the context, he just connected their mouth to their heart. Because the words that came out of their mouth were directly related to what's in our heart. The heart is the tree, and the words that they are speaking are, is the fruit. Just look at the words that they're speaking. I mean, how loving was that? He just healed a man and set him free from the bondage that plagued him. And look what they're saying to him. And I'll tell you this, if your heart is drinking from the poison well of the evil one, then the fruit on your tree is going to be rotten. But if the roots are drinking from the well of living water, the fruit is going to be healthy. If you're an unbeliever, you're a child of the devil. And the words you speak will be from that well. But if you're a believer, you're a child of God. And the words that you speak will be from that, will be Holy Spirit filled, filled with life and living water. So if you want to have a healthy heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. By the way, we all know that the word, with the word, a seed can be planted. Okay, well, and the fruit will be relative to the seed that's planted. Good seed will make a good tree, resulting in good fruit. If the seed is bad, the fruit is bad. Don't eat of that tree. So Jesus goes on to tell him in 34, verse 34, you brood of vipers. Loose translation, serpents with poisonous mouths. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Brood of vipers. Where have we heard that before? Yep, in Matthew 3, where John the Baptist calls them the same thing, brood of vipers. Why? Because the words that come out of their mouths is death. For sure, it's spiritual death to all that hear them. Proverbs 18.21 says, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those who love to talk will eat of the fruit of it. So by the words that they were speaking, they were impacting the spiritual well-being of those whom they were trusted to them by God. They were his sheep. And they were keeping his people from entering the kingdom of God by their teaching, by the stuff coming out of their mouths. In James 3, it says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so to lie against the truth. This wisdom is not which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder full of every evil thing. And you see this where the people were afraid to align themselves with Jesus, or the Pharisees would put themselves, put them out of the synagogue. In John 9, 22, the man, the man who was healed, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone confessing Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. So Jesus told him, it's written in Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice the son of hell as yourselves. Well, Jesus just told them that they are the sons of hell. How? Through their words, by what comes out of their mouths. And the Sadducees teaching, man, that was even worse. Because they had led others to deny the truth of bodily resurrection, of future punishment and reward, and the existence of angels. So I guess for them, this was their best life now. And Jesus said of them, paraphrasing by their very words, they have brought condemnation upon themselves because they have covered their ears and refused to hear the gospel. But the multitudes were amazed. And not only here, but in other places in the Gospels. Because Jesus made the prophecies come to life. And his miracles proved every bit of who he was and who he said he was. And the Pharisees couldn't deny the miracles. So you know what they did? They tried to discredit them. But it goes much deeper than that. For Jesus said in Luke 645 the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil for the his mouth speaks from that which builds his heart i like how this one man said this when someone opens up their mouth you can see what their treasure is when someone opens up their mouth you can see what their treasure is whether it's good or evil and by their speech, you can pretty much figure out, although God's the ultimate judge, whether someone is going to be in heaven or hell. And although by the grace of God, while they were still living, they still had a chance to choose. But once they died, their decision was locked in. Words have meaning. Our words, the things we say have meaning to God. And in verse 36, Jesus say, and I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you shall be justified. By your words, you shall be condemned. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, right? Every careless or in some translations reads idle word that you speak. Well, here's a question. How many words do you think you speak a day? When I looked it up, it's somewhere between seven to 15,000 on the average. Well, how are we going to give an account for every in each careless word when we stand before God? Because out of that many, I'm sure there's going to be a few. Do you all think that maybe there's an angel following us around, writing them down? I don't. I believe that God has the ability to remember and recall every single word you have ever spoken or ever will speak exactly as it was said. And not only yours, but everyone who has ever had breath. And I don't even think it's a blip in his memory bank. Memory bank. Just like every sin everyone has ever committed. And you're probably saying, yeah, that's probably recorded in a book, remember it somewhere. But I say that book, if there is one for that, is not for God. It's for you to see proof that it was noted and written before you even got there. If indeed you have the arrogance to question God, God doesn't need a book to remember anything. 
That's why it's written about in our, in our about our repentance for sins in Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. You know, we would do well that whenever we speak words, we need to be mindful that our words have great power and meaning. With the words that come out of our mouth, we can bless or we can curse. We can build up and encourage, or we can slander and malign. In James chapter 3, it speaks about the tongue and how mighty it is. It could be compared to the small rudder on the biggest ship. It's able to change its course. And it's also like the smallest spark that is able to set the whole forest ablaze. It says in 3.2 of James, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle, bridle the whole body as well. Bridling the tongue is compared to the bridle and bit in a horse's mouth, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you Texans in here, is a piece of metal that lays on top of their tongue and out of this, comes out of the sides of their mouth. And with that little piece of metal and a leather bridle, one can control the whole body and the course in which you are traveling. A perfect man here means that he is growing spiritually. We will, we will be able to have more control over what we speak. And if we have complete control over what we speak, then we will become that quote unquote perfect man. Of course, Jesus is our example and we're to become more and more like him as we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. As pastors, we have an even higher level of discipline in giving an account for standing up here and giving the word and saying, thus says the Lord. James 3, 1, it says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing as we shall incur a much stricter judgment. Elsewhere, it says in James 1, 19, know this, my beloved brethren, not let but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know, that's not just really good advice. That's something we need to apply to ourselves daily. I mean, that's for me, for sure. We are the only species that relate to one another with words. Every day we speak to people and our relationships hinge on what? on our interaction with them. You can either make friends or enemies by what you say. A war can be started with just a sentence. Or with a well-placed word, peace could be established. With words we ask, with words we teach, with words we tell, without words, we would all be doing just a bunch of grunting and finger pointing. I know that it said a picture is worth a thousand words. But without the words, how can you explain the picture? With words, we praise our God. With words, we pray to our God. Words are eternal. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words shall never pass away. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void. But it will, uh, but but accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. John one reads: Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being genesis 1 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and then god said let there be light and there was light and god said in 1 6 let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters from the heavens and the earth and it happened and god kept saying and it kept happening by the word of his power he spoke everything into being through his word. Jesus, 
All you have to do is be. Listen to this from Proverbs. Proverbs has much to say about words. 16, 23, 24. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Pleasant are the words. Pleasant are words are a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Here's a few more. 11.9. With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. But perversion in it crushes the spirit. Oh, sorry. But knowledge, forgive me. But knowledge, but through knowledge, the righteous will be. Let me read that again. With, the, with his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Makes more sense, right? 15.4. A soothing tongue is a tree of life. A tree of life. But perversion in it crushes the spirit. 18.4. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Life-giving water. Man, that's a bubbling spring within them that Jesus told us about. 12, 17 through 19. He who speaks the truth tells what's right, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Check this one, 25, 18. Like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his neighbor. So in other words, telling lies, is, telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax and wounding them with a sword or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Ow. I like this one, 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. <clears throat> Titus 3.2 in the NLT says they must not slander anyone and avoid quarreling instead they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone I mean that goes for all of us Psalm 19.14 may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you O Lord in your sight O Lord my rock and my redeemer Here's a couple of anonymous quotes. Words are free. It's how you use them that may cost. And words can, words can inspire and words can destroy. Choose yours well. You know, one way we progress in our sanctification process is by learning to guard our mouth. Sanctification means made holy. We need to carefully consider each word and tone. That comes out of our mouths. That's hard. I know. The, this message made me very aware. Of the words being said by myself. And what I hear from others. And hopefully. This will be more meaningful to you too. Here's something to think about. The tone that we use. Did you know that the very tone. In which you say something. Can change up. How your words are received. And how your message is interpreted. I mean, you can say something one way and by your tone, it can come across a totally different way to someone else. Not only that, but by your tone, check this out. It can seriously affect somebody's willingness to listen to you. I mean, if you really think about it, this is some scary stuff. Like, so I got into it. I mean, not cowering in fear scary. Don't get me wrong. But surely something to be mindful of. Like, as God hears every word you say. Because let me remind you this verse. Every careless word that they shall speak, they shall render an account for it in the day of judgment. By our words, they can affect how we govern our home. Like, whether a man or a woman, whether we are a man or a woman, like, we all have responsibilities. And those responsibilities require a decision to be made, decisions to be made. 
And how do we make that known? It's through our speech. We can have peace in the home or it can be a place of conflict. If the husband acts like a dictator over his wife or if she handpacks her husband all the time, it's, and you know, constantly, it's surely not going to be a godly and pleasant place to live. I mean, our, in our marriages, how we relate to one another through our conversation results in either ever in a blessed marriage or a broken marriage. I can offer this in case of a full-blown argument, like both have said some things that were hurtful. And the tool to shut that down and make it right and restore peace and harmony and love is this. Like, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Repentance and communication is the key. Many splits and divorces are because of things said and words with said with words and someone with a bad mouth and either one or both remaining unrepentant. How about with our children? The way we speak to them can create a loving, caring environment or discord by berating them at every turn. How many children and even some adults are living unhappy, unfruitful, and godless lives. Why? Because of the way they were spoken to by their parents, and they carried that on to adulthood. And after that, they went on to raise their families up in the way they were brought up, resulting in generation generational curses. Man, there's a lot of broken families today. By the words we speak to them, they will either live a blessed or a cursed life. And surely, if we're not teaching them about the Lord, we're sending them down the wrong road, like Brother Tootie brought in his sermon last week. Why? Because they don't know any better. And there's more. There's more? Yes, there's more. Are y'all still with me? Amen. Like, how many times a day do we run across the people? Run across people are using the name of the Lord in vain. Using the name in Lord in vain is literally calling down judgment upon others. And get this without realizing that we are really calling down judgment upon ourselves. We are actually cursing ourselves. God's not going to put up with that. Using the name of losing the Lord's name in vain, saying OMG, for instance. Or calling out for him to damn someone is carelessly using the Lord's name and not giving him the honor and the respect and the reverence due him. We all know in Exodus, should know, in Exodus 27, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. But the phrase, oh, my God, can reverently be used when you're in prayer or beseeching his favor or trying to get him to bend his ear to you. Excuses. Man, excuses like Brother Tootie brought are actually curses that we put upon ourselves. It's a way to justify not doing something that we know we really should be doing. They show our complacency beforehand. And they are heard out loud. And they may lead to our demise on the last day if we fail to receive the free gift of eternal life by making excuses. I mean, is anyone feeling convicting yet? Because I know this made me check myself. How about lying? I know that we've all done it. And if you say you haven't, then you're probably lying. <laughs> But by what gain would there be in speaking dishonestly? Well, I'm glad you asked, because to some, it's a way they think that they can avoid punishment. But for them, when they're exposed, it usually results in more severe punishment. For others, it's a way to try and get attention or sympathy. And then there are some who are trying to make themselves out to be something that they're not puffing themselves up by over exaggerating okay, exaggerating what they've done or their capabilities. Say that three times fast. 
These are deliberately false and misleading statements used for the purpose of deceiving others. What does God think of lying? Well, let's take a look. If you want to go over there, if y'all if y'all could light it up there, Proverbs 6, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Okay, and it says there, haughty eyes and a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that defies, uh, just a minute. These six things, I want to point this out first. These six things are things that the Lord hates. So he hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. An abomination means, check this out, the Lord detests these to the utmost. Like, this is on the top of his hate list. Like, he's got a list. Okay, this is on top. Okay. So, okay. Okay, first on the hate list, verse 17 says, haughty eyes and a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, and verse 19, a false witness who others lies and one who spreads strife or discord among who? Among brothers. Wow. Check that. So there are three verbal sins. Okay. There's three mental sins and there's one overt sin, which means they don't even try to hide it. Okay. Did anyone notice out of the list of these that are abomination to the Lord? That lying is listed here twice. Out of the three verbal sins, two of them are lying. If it was an abomination to the to God only once, that would be enough, right? What about twice? These lies, careless words or idle words, where does that come from? Well, who's the father of the lies? That's right, Satan. Romans 16, 18 says, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. For by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Wow. Now that would also probably come under the category of stealing the seed that was planted after receiving the gospel. For that's the evil one's M.O., he hates the word of God. He's always coming after the word. Look at the temptation of Jesus. He was twisting up the word to get him to fall and fail. Who was, who was in the Garden of Eden? Twisting up the word again. Yep. And don't be deceived. Deceived because he's going to try to twist it up on you also. What about cussing? Cursing. Filthy language. You bet. Definitely on the list of careless or idle words. I mean, you don't have to go very far to hear some pretty vulgar speech anymore. I mean, it's almost like it's everywhere. It's, it's like a second language to some. I mean, I'm seriously guilty of that one in the past before I was saved, especially when I was working construction. And some people have practiced this down to a fine art to the point where they could spew it out without even giving a second thought like in sentences even, and caustic speech. You know what that does? It, it defiles everyone around who hears it. But you can change the atmosphere by your presence. As a believer, with the presence of Christ in you, when you enter into a group or conversation, did you ever notice how a lot of the time the filthy words start falling off or getting less? Or if you're talking to one other person and they're cussing and you aren't, Notice how, like, they'll actually scale back their language a little bit. I mean, I've even had some, knowing that I'm a Christian, apologize after they cuss, say a cuss word. In Colossians 4, 6, it says, as far as wisdom is concerned, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. In other words, protecting our witness, making the most of the opportunity and its speech. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so you, that you may know how you should respond to each person. 
that, along with coarse jesting or dirty jokes, God calls that out in Colossians 3 8. But now you also put all put all put them all aside, anger, malice, wrath, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. And then if we tack on verse 9, don't lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Now that's a good word. And Ephesians 5, 3, and 4, but do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. We should now be getting a message if we don't know it already that there is no place for these kind of things in the Christian's vocabulary. There's also slandering, maligning, and hurtful speech, murdering people with our mouths, and racism. I mean, looking down on people because of the heritage that they were born with. Man, when I was young, people hated Jews. They hated them. Like, I wouldn't tell anyone I was Jewish back then. And when I went into the service and when they asked, I told them to consider me no preference for my religion. That was one of the choices is what to put on my dog tags, you know, when they find me, you know, or whatever. But, um, and why? Because if something happened to me, whether I was a hostage or killed, who knows how my body would be treated if they, you know, when they found it. And racism still goes on today, unfortunately. I mean, you don't have to go to the big city to see it because like it's still right here in Rock Springs. Sad, but it's true. How about gossiping? The Lord forget, forbids gossiping or whisperings, as the King James puts it, or tailbearing. And Paul backs that up in 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there may be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. For I am afraid when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. And I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have practiced. Man, that strong statement was made because of unrepentance. Gossip. Man, gossip is so wicked. Why? Because most of the time it's repeating information that isn't correct and it's not ours to tell. And it's called whisperings because it's said pretty much in secret or behind closed doors. And we know it's wrong. While we are saying it because if it was heard in public, right, the person repeating it would look pretty bad. And did you ever notice that gossip is pretty much bad news spread around by someone else? But gossiping isn't good news. These are idle, careless, and hurtful words. How much of that would be said if you included Jesus in your conversation? And if you're ever in a position where gossiping is taking place, you can either leave the conversation or better yet say, let's pray for that person. How about deceit? To deceive someone is to cause them to believe something that's not true and to cheat someone for personal advantage. Jesus said in Matthew 24, the first thing about the end times is don't be deceived. How do you think that's going to come? In words. There are pastors today that are unfortunately like, just like the Pharisees, misleading people and that entrusted to them by teaching them false truths. Sending people down the wrong road, the Broadway road, mainly for their own gain. Jesus said in the last days, there will even be those declaring themselves to be Christ. Wow. There's something that caught me off guard the other day. Y'all might have seen the video 
a woman was silently standing in public and praying in her head. In her head. Like nothing. No words were even coming out of her mouth. And she was arrested for it. The words were in her head and were unspoken. And because it was in public, she was taken in because it's now a crime there to violate a public space with prayer. Even silence, even silent prayer. Wow. Like it's coming, people. We need to be ready. By our very words, we will be condemned. And Jude 8, it says there are those who defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Like even today, people are defiling their bodies with sexual morality, drugs, and alcohol, and rejecting all authority, giving respect to no one, and even re reviling angelic beings, beings with whom they don't even realize who they're dealing with, dealing with. Like, be careful with your words. Hey, but check this out. Jesus also said by our words, we can be justified. How can we be justified? How can we be made right with God? First of all, by realizing that we all have a heart condition. In order to get help with this kind of sickness and sin that's just killing us, there's only one cure. And that's because this spirit, it's spiritual sickness. We can't just go to a regular doctor. We have to go to the great physician, Jesus, or we will die in our sins with no hope and face hell with no face eternity in hell. And Jesus can give us that heart transplant. Now, I promise you right now, if you turn from trusting in yourself and turn into the one you can trust in, you can have that assurance that you're right with God. With your words, by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as you haven't already, turn from your sin and surrender your life to him. And when you do, here are his words. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean. Remember the other night when in prayer meeting with the ashes and the water and it was sprinkled and made them clean. Man, if you're not here for prayer meeting, like you're missing out on some stuff. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you and you'll hear us. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amen. And I will be found by you. For all those blasphemies that Jesus said would be forgiven, men can only be forgiven by repentance and belief. So with words, we ask for forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. And by the words of scripture, and if we are truly repentant, we shall be forgiven. And if you are a believer, then the Lord has given us this verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we are confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, King Jesus. Here's something that I came across. Just give this a try with your words just for one week. Just one week. See if it makes a difference. I've already tried it. So I checked it out. And it really makes you think about the words that you're saying. There are six things. Okay. And if it's too much, just pick out one or two. And you don't have to write them down. I, I printed out a few copies of it. You can just grab one on the way out if you want to have it. But try this week just to say only something positive every time you speak. Say something positive every time you speak. Don't grumble or complain about anything this week. Don't boast or brag about anything. Don't gossip or spread any bad information. 
and don't malign someone or run someone down. And number six, don't defend or excuse yourself no matter what situation you find yourself in. God will vindicate you. Now, some of you are saying, now that's a challenge. And I say, that's what God expects of his saints. There's power in words. And God uses words and gives us words that we may be saved. And I don't ever want this to become common because the gospel has the power to transform lives. We repent and we believe the gospel confessing with our mouth the words, Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead on the third day. That results in us being made right with God. We are then washed by the blood of the lamb. Forgiven for all the evil that came forth out of our heart and verbalized by our mouth. And then all those blasphemous sins and unpardonable sins, we shall be washed clean of and saved. And God remembers them no more. Here are some words that have meaning. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus said to the Father, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Man, let that be us. Like Brother Judy brought, make no excuses. Jesus didn't. And he did the most. Certainly we can do the least, right? We, and when we are tasked with something, let it be not, not my will, but thy will be done. Let that come out of our mouths. And you know what? Take comfort in this. The evil one will never win. Even though he knows the scriptures very well, so he knows what's going to happen. And even though he has the plan of God and he has a preview and he knows where he needs to attack, God still thwarts his schemes and his evil plans at every turn. You know why? No matter, no matter, notice no matter what we've gone through and when we've relied upon God, he's always brought us through the fire. That's why it says all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. If God be for us, who could be against us? I mean, God always wins and Jesus never loses. There's one fine, let me just get a drink. There's one final thing that I want to bring before you before we close out. Again, it says in Colossians 4, 5, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. We know by the grace of God that we as believers have a hope and a future with the Lord. But however, there are still those who don't know Christ and they still remain under God's judgment. Man, this is so important. We also as believers know this very well then we have been not only been made aware of our own sinfulness and our need for a savior and the accountability for our soul. But when we have been told that much has been given, much is required. You see, when we got up this morning, did you realize that this day is a gift from God? That by his grace, he opened our eyes this morning. And we've been given another day. We weren't promised that. And nowhere does it say we're getting another one. And we've been made aware, although we also might have thought at one time, that it's a common belief among men. Well, if there is a God and our accountability to him is on a relative scale, whereby if you are good enough and your good outweighs your bad, then you'll be accepted by God and welcomed into heaven. And through scripture, we know that this isn't true. For it says in Romans 3.10 that there are none who do good. There is none righteous, no, not one. So by the Lord's perfect standard, none of us could ever enter or could ever outweigh our bad. So therefore, except for God being merciful, all men would perish. But by the fact and only the fact of his graciousness toward men, he gave us a promise. And that promise is whoever shall believe the gospel shall have eternal life. 
And that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Now, that's good news. That's really good news. In fact, the gospel is the best news that we've ever heard. I mean, do y'all think it's good news? I mean, if y'all think it's good to say, I have good news. I have good news, right? Man, if, okay, so if the news is that good, why aren't we telling everyone that about it? I mean, everyone we can about it. I mean, if it's not, then we can just all go home and keep it to ourselves. But with that gift of one more day, why aren't we telling everyone we can what God has done for us and what God could do for them? I mean, if you're saved, you're his messenger. And God has entrusted us with his amazing word that has the power to save souls. You might be saying, well, that task is overwhelming. So I'll end with this. I heard it from Sister Allie, and uh, y'all might have heard it already, but it really hit me, so I'm sharing it with you, okay? And it's called The Starfish Story. Have y'all ever heard it? And it says, one day a man was walking along a beach, and it was covered with thousands of starfish. I mean, so many, you couldn't even count them, okay? And they were all dying, and the life-giving water was right there, okay? And, but they just couldn't get to it. And he came upon this boy who was throwing them back in the water, one by one, back into the ocean. And the man said to him, look how many there are. You can't possibly save them all. And the boy bent down and picked up another one and threw it back in and said, it just made a difference to that one. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will open up the doors for the gospel, Father, for your gospel to go forth. I pray that everyone who heard this message today will use the words that you gave us to change lives, change lives and souls, that they would be saved for your glory. And I pray for those who are lost and who don't know you and how blessed that they can be if they'll just call upon you. For you, Lord, said, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet, even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. We can just come as we are and none of us are turned away. Thank you, Jesus, for making the way for us, for dying on the cross for our sins, that we may have life. May we use the gift of another day to advance your kingdom so that when we come into your glory, we will not be ashamed for having squandered our gift and our opportunity to serve you. For you alone are worthy. We love you, Lord. We'll serve you all the days of our lives. I pray that we will all be more of the words we say and how they impact our own well-being and others around us. And they would glorify you, Lord, in your hearing. And it's in the name of your holy and righteous son, Jesus, that we ask and pray. Amen. And thank you.